All right, thanks everyone. Um, <clears throat> so as we saw in the previous presentation, um, A to D conversion instruments are getting cheaper. Um, they have higher resolution, higher sampling rate, uh, channel density is growing. Um, and so uh, I think you can see that our ability to acquire radiation detector signals is rapidly surpassing our ability to analyze them in real time um, or anything even closely approaching real time. <clears throat> and there are a lot of, yep, it's on. Yeah, uh, so there are a lot of multimodal radiation detector systems that are being developed for NNSA and other government agencies right now. And they employ techniques like gamma and neutron time of arrival stamping, uh, energy measurements, multiplicity measurements. Um, you'll see some information about fast neutron imagers uh, and also spectroscopic gamma imagers. And some of those systems, as we just saw, can output hundreds of gigabytes to terabytes of data uh, from just a single measurement. So at NC State, we're working with Oak Ridge National Lab and Sandia National Lab, and also more recently, Duke University Physics Department, to try to develop some alternative methods for data compression and analysis in these kinds of high throughput radiation detection systems. So I'm just gonna jump into the systems that we're working with and describe them. Um, the first project is with Sandia National Laboratories in California, it's called the Single Volume Scatter Camera. So as a reminder, I've shown a cartoon of a multi-volume scatter camera, kind of the traditional design, where you have two planes of scintillator cells. In some cases, like Compton scatter cameras, the back plane may actually be a semiconductor. Uh, but the idea is that two sequential interactions in each plane uh, define a pointing vector uh, that basically points back away from the camera, and you can use the kinematics of the interaction to infer the polar angle of the scatter and therefore define a cone pointing out from the detector towards the source. And after the superposition of many cones, you can identify hot spots in the scene. And this is great for standoff um, detection because it actually has a fairly wide, almost four pi field of view. Um, <clears throat> the problem with multi-volume scatter cameras is, is the problem of efficiency. You have to have the two interactions, one in each plane, and very often um, the two interactions won't occur. So the um, idea that Sandia has been developing um, is a single volume scatter camera. And so this, instead of using multiple volumes of scintillator, uses a single contiguous volume of scintillator that's nominally about 20 by 20 by 20 centimeters, eight inches on a side, and it takes advantage of new advances in pixelated photo detectors to measure the position and time of arrival of photons created by scintillation events inside the detector. So Sandy has shown that relative to a multi-volume scatter camera, the SVSC could potentially improve in efficiency by a factor of 10, thereby reducing measurement time pretty substantially. Um, however, what they also showed is that in order to attain that kind of efficiency, you have to be able to resolve sequential scatter events that are separated by only one or two centimeters, which is challenging. Um, in order to do that, you really have to fully digitize all of the photo detector pixels' responses as a function of their XY position and of time, and then analyze them using some fitting technique like maximum likelihood estimation. Um, and so that need for a lot of digitizers, in this case it would be about 2048 for a low channel density system, um, is one of the most significant challenges to designing a function single volume scatter camera. Um, so we're supporting their laboratory directed research and development project uh, by exploring an alternative uh, physical uh, SVS, SVSC design. Um, it's called the optically segmented single volume scatter camera and there's a cartoon of it over on the right. Um, essentially, it divides the scintillator cell into an array, a 2D array, of, in this case 32 by 32, optically isolated channels. And so these are long skinny channels and they're wrapped with, uh, in this case, a specular reflector that keeps light within the channel. Um, and so the large number of digitizers that were once needed now gets replaced by a large number of discriminators, but those are of lower cost. Um, the XY location determination is actually fairly straightforward. That comes from the channels that actually received light pulse. Um, the photon arrival time distribution and the number of photons that show up at the photo detectors depends on the Z location. That's the location up and down in these channels where the scintillation occurred. Um, turns out that actually determining the Z location, of course, is the most challenging part. Um, however, you only need to digitize two photodetectors per channel that receives a hit in this design. 
<clears throat> so what makes it challenging is uh, it's really the problem of uh, low scintillation light production in organic scintillators com um, coupled with fairly low light collection efficiency. Um, so for a typical event where you have an energy deposition of something like an MEV, um, you're only going to collect a few hundred photons on either end with the photo detectors. Um, and so uh, the pulses actually look quite ragged. And in order to determine the Z position of the scintillation, you really end up having to fit the full waveform of the um, photoelectron pulse. Um, so we're using JON4 to try to develop models of light pulses that we can use in maximum likelihood estimation to infer the Z location from that time history of photon arrivals. So <clears throat> uh, I'm sure you've heard this before. Uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, the problem with basing the analysis solely on a light transport model at JON4 is that it's probably not going to be right. Um, and so we're doing some small scale experiments with single optical channels. So this is a picture of a detector that's one by one by 20 centimeters and it's got two fast photomultiplier tubes on either end. Um, we're basically measuring the time of arrival distribution for photons using this scintillator um, using a small collimated source and we'll use those to try to validate, and I say validate, what I really mean is modify um, the light pole shape that's predicted by JON4. <clears throat> so uh, we're also working with uh, Oak Ridge and Sandia National Laboratories on their neutron coated aperture imager uh, shown here. So the coated aperture imager is, a, is an array of uh, plastic scintillators, uh, specifically EJ299. There are 16 of those. They're in a four by four square array. Um, internally, each one is segmented into 10 by 10 optically isolated channels. So each of those detectors actually offers um, 100 optical channels, and they're measured using an array of photomultiplier tubes on the back. Um, the way that the coded aperture camera works is that the aperture that you see here, um, basically uh, the source casts the shadow of the aperture onto the imaging plane, um, and then that original uh, distribution of impinging radiation is decoded from that, from that pattern of shadows. Um, in this case, they're using a uniformly redundant array for the aperture, um, which is its own anti-mask when rotated by 90 degrees. So this thing basically takes two images, one with a mask and one orientation, then rotated 90 degrees. The difference between those two images will remove the contribution of isotropic background. Um, one other thing that's worth mentioning is that in addition to being sensitive to fast neutrons, it is also sensitive to gamma rays um, and can do particle discrimination. <coughs> Furthermore, the most recent modification was to put a zinc sulfide layer on the front that's impregnated with lithium so that they can actually detect thermal neutrons as well. So it has three modes of imaging. Um, we were able to take this system out to the Nevada test site this summer as part of the CBT campaign, uh, where Michigan was also present. Uh, Sarah brought her dual particle imager and Jean brought uh, Orion and Polaris. Um, and we did a series of measurements with category one special nuclear material, uh, including weapons grade uh, plutonium metal and highly enriched uranium metal. Uh, besides measuring those sources uh, bare, we also measured them in a number of reflectors and shielding. Um, and so I've shown one of the images that we got. So I'm not sure how well you can see the uh, units here, but basically um, each one of these ticks is a five centimeter uh, distance. All right. So this whole image is about 60 centimeters by 60 centimeters. The large circle is a 7.6 centimeter diameter weapons grade plutonium sphere, uh, just 30 centimeters away from that. So about this far away, uh, we had a Californian point source. And uh, you can see that we're still able to distinguish them. Um, so <clears throat> the neutron coded aperture imager actually uh, acquires a lot of data. There are 16 op 1,600 optical channels that are acquired from 64 photomultiplier tubes that ultimately are monitoring the 16 physical detectors. Um, the data is collected using four of these struck 250 mega sample per second digitizers. They can acquire the data in user programmable gate arrays. In other words, they can compress the data or they can get full waveforms. They also support a USB 3 interface, which allows you to get the full waveforms at this rate. Um, and so basically, out of one of these measurements, what you really get is a, is a giant data cube um, that represents the XY location of the interaction, the particle type, the time of arrival, um, and the energy deposited. So what we wanted to do was to try to exploit the dynamics of fission chain reactions to reconstruct a different type of image. Um, and so this is a time-dependent measurement. And 
for the moment, just assume that I know time zero is when a fission occurred. Um, in a typical detection event, neutron count, the amount of energy that's deposited in the detector is going to be less than the apparent kinetic energy of the neutron. It has to be that way. But it's true that for some fissions, you may observe a late arriving neutron count where sometimes the energy deposited in the detector is greater than the apparent kinetic energy of the particle when you account for the distance and the flight time. <clears throat> the reason that that can occur is because there was actually a fission in between the first fission and the neutron detection. In other words, this neutron is probably the result of a fission chain reaction, not just a single neutron emission. So the question is, how do you decide when time zero occurs? So one way of doing that is to take the current neutron count and look backwards to the preceding gamma arrival time. Correct that for the flight distance, and then call that time zero. And then your measure of time of arrival is really relative to that preceding gamma ray. <clears throat> so essentially what you do is you construct a histogram of all events that plot the energy deposition versus the time of arrival as I've just described it. And this is the line where the energy deposition is equal to the apparent kinetic energy. And you can separate events, those below the line deposited less energy than the apparent kinetic energy, and the ones above deposited more, which indicates that they're probably from fission chain reactions. <clears throat> so it's a little bit complicated working with this curved contour, so what we normally do is redefine the flight time um, to be the flight time minus the flight time you would expect if this had been the full energy deposition, and that defines a vertical line, and you basically just discriminate particles on one side or the other. The ones we're looking for are the ones that are on the right-hand side. So because you have this cube of data that tells you the trigger time, charge collected, and particle type, um, you can actually reconstruct an image by selectively using only the uh, neutrons that were late and deposited too much energy corresponding to their apparent kinetic energy. In other words, that image should show only multiplying material. <coughs> I'd love to show you this, but Jack Linkus is going to talk about it tomorrow. Okay, so the last uh, experiment that we're involved in is working with uh, Duke University's Triangle University's nuclear lab to do some high precision measurements of organic scintillator neutron response. Basically, we're going to use the tunnel uh, Van de Graaff accelerator to produce monoenergetic neutron beams that we fire onto a target detector. It could be steel beam, for example. And we're going to um, use an array of backing detectors shown as an arc in the two pictures there. Um, and basically take advantage of kinematics, yeah, I see the sign, um, kinematics to uh, reconstruct the proton recoil energy in the target detector. Um, and it's a very straightforward, very easy to interpret measurement because you're really just relying on the scatter angle in the lab frame to infer the proton recoil energy. So we've done some analysis of the precision of the measurement. The width of these distributions is controlled by the geometry of the experiment. They won't get narrower the longer you count. But what you're actually interested in is the resolution of the mean proton recoil energy. And the longer you measure, the less the uncertainty in the mean proton recoil energy will be. It's going to go down with the square root of the number of detections. So looking at uh, just the 45 degree scatter angle in the lab and two neutron energies, um, 3 MeV and 100 KeV, it uh, looks like we're going to get sub 1% resolution on the mean proton recoil energy. Um, <clears throat> now, these don't account for the spread in neutron beam energy. However, that is fairly low. The further back the target detector is, the lower it can be. Um, and it doesn't uh, account for the uncertainty in the backing detector placement. So one of the things that we're trying to do is design a new way to place detectors <coughs> that allows us to place them more precisely. Well, that's a 3D printed detector holder. Uh, basically, it comes from doing a Google SketchUp drawing of the experiment and back projecting the detector's direction relative to the target. So what makes this a high channel density experiment? Well, Tunnel has located a cache of organic scintillator material that we can use to make 300 detectors. <clears throat> um, we don't actually need to digitize these signals. All of this is based upon time tagging when each detector fired. So rather than try to measure, to perform this measurement with 300 independent discriminators, we're looking at different ways of trying to tag each detector and multiplex them to a single digitizer. So one way of doing that possibly is to cause each detector to ring at a specific frequency 
and then identify which detector fired based upon its power spectrum in the Fourier domain. Um, so I'll wrap it up now. Basically, um, we're just working with Oak Ridge, Sandia, and Duke on three different uh, projects to try to improve data analysis and compression. Some of the techniques that we're looking at is actually altering the experiment design uh, to reduce the data velocity, or uh, in the case of the single volume, in, excuse me, in the case of the uh, neutron coated aperture imager, uh, to try to identify specific pulse patterns that correspond to fission chain reactions. Thank you. The motivation for this work is to provide a simulation tool for nuclear nonproliferation and safeguards uh, for fission applications.